This is Radio 4, and now night fishing. About a year ago, the writer Greville Lindop came across a dusty cassette marked Fishing Poems 1983. Recorded on it were poems read aloud by an almost totally unknown poet from the Lake District, Tom Rawling. Tom died in 1996 and is now considered to be one of the finest Cumbrian poets. His poems about fishing were greatly admired by Seamus Heaney and Ted Hughes. Greville has travelled to Eskdale in the Lake District to the source of the inspiration behind those poems with a noted angler and guide, Finlay Wilson. They will fish from dusk to dawn to catch the magnificent and elusive sea trout. Well, that's the plan. I want to read a group of fishing poems. I hope that they're authentic to fishermen, but that they're about more than just fishing. We're just outside Crag Farm at the moment, and we're going to go round the back and follow the path that Tom Rowling would have taken down to the river, across the fields. Even the great sunshine, it's got quite an atmosphere to it, hasn't it? And you can see how crystal clear it is. You can hear more tumbling water just further downstream here. And whenever you hear that, you know that you're approaching the neck of another pool and you're always hoping that it's going to be the pool in the dark hours. We'd never start fishing till dusk and it just adds a, an extra captivation to the pursuit of them. The fact that you're going to hook into one of these bars of silver from the sea in a crystal clear river at night while away the, the days and years. Still the most, one of the most enigmatic fish. Tom Lawling's poems about fishing have a peculiar intensity, a strange, slightly frightening quality that's vivid and almost obsessive. He was a driven man, you can hear it in the titles of his two books of poems, Ghosts at My Back and The Names of the Sea Trout. No one else has conveyed so piercingly the drama, the intensity and the sheer strangeness of fishing, above all, of night fishing for sea trout. I hope to experience some of that tonight with Finlay. Tom Lawling was born in Ennerdale in the Lake District in 1916. His family had been farming on the shores of Ennerdale Water for at least 300 years. He was the son of the village schoolmaster, attended his father's school and was caned by him every day. Lawling eventually became a teacher himself, of children with special needs. He preferred that because it didn't tie him down to a syllabus. He married and had two daughters. He didn't begin writing poetry until he was 60 years old. Once he was retired, the poems poured out of him, and they were about Cumvia, about his family, his childhood memories of Annadale, about the hard labour entailed in making a living from the land. Also, they were about fishing. Above all, fishing for sea trout. <laughs> Beware. Yeah, adders. Oh. That's the fishing shelter. Certainly one of the most important things is having a good look while it's daylight. Studying the pools that you're gonna fish as, as much as possible. Ideally you'd be looking for sea trout that are just you know fresh in from the salt water, a bit more angsty but they're very easily spooked sea trout, which is why we indulge in this night fishing malarkey.
It's amazing to watch as he goes down to scope the pool. He's walking like a cat. Water's fished out there. This experience of fishing at night is quite, quite different from fishing during the day. It's a very heightened, strange, distorted experience almost. And now the next group of poems try to describe this. I think of it as one poem, really. Beginning with the reconnaissance at the, in the afternoon and ending with uh, fishing right through to dawn. Catching the fish at last. Sea trout run. With the fixed intent of a stalking cat, I belly slide to spy where rippled water twists and blurs the grey stone depths. When a stray wind shift opens a moment's tunnel for slit eyes, and then a heliograph is flashing. Two, another, more sea trout tails are fanning, uncertain of their station in this flotilla come to harbour. They have come back again, slipped in on last night's tide past windscaled towers, herald in that seasons still succeed, at least this year. A feast lies here to be won by stratagems of rod and line under the camouflage of night. Now in the sun the eye tries to etch maps of range and aiming point bright enough to read when dark deceives. Back from the bank I notice earth's greenness on my palm and where a bramble thorn has clawed its line of blood. And there's a sea trout jumping in the middle of the pool. Do you... Oi! There's another sea trout. There's an incredible amount of fish in that pool. This is the time of night where you start to get the quality of the light changes. It takes on that the mystical hue. Once we get a little darker still. Sounds of fish splashing. Getting more amplified. That sounded like a hefty fish. Yeah, these, these are um, lures. So really you're just appealing to their, their aggressive nature and their, their habit. This one's a, a muddled deer here a wing of blue and black fox here and a little bit of pearl flash with some kind of glitter on them a couple of turns of tinsel on it they flash and shimmer like that in the mm. sea so. and sometimes they can't resist and they'll come chasing after it on the hit from a sea trout you know, hitting a surface lure like that I mean it, the water will explode Night fishermen. I come at dusk to the dub where sea trout rest, let the day slide behind the ridge, weighed by the dry stone wall till the distant bank advances. I hear an old ewe's husky cough, the water slopping, slapping, but listen, taut, for the important interjection of a lunging fish. Lips taste the mist of falling dew, the tang of trodden nettles cuts through the milkiness of cows. Earth's body scent floods in. Skin opens to the night, unlocks another sense first recognized in youth, found then from further back, before books, before words. The body pulses with the valley's beat, absorbing and absorbed. 
moves when the moment comes. Boots remember boulders, where to turn half left, then right, a steep step down, a trodden path, the ancient track. Now touches, master, blind man fingering of reel and rod, the hook's keen point. Feet shuffle, feel the ground, delicately crunch the gravel. Body poised, ready to reach beneath the mirror of the pool. Hands in time with the flexing spring of built bamboo. The back cast pulling, storing power for the forward drive, the lures leap. The look of the river changes completely. Do you just have this surface like a silver mirror with black silhouettes of shapes that must be trees, but they don't look like trees anymore. Submersed into another world. Long after midnight, only the body pouring into the water world, through the rod, through the line, through the searching lure, conjuring a trick for sea trout eyes. The stars are cold and clear, the ruse transparent. I wade in deeper, share with the fish its lateral line, the currents push. My fingers fifteen yards away, coaxing feathers to flicker and sway. A breath touches my cheek, grows to a breeze, ruffles the pool, brings a drift of cloud, the lure comes alive. A soft pluck, then the barb point bites deep, holds fast in gristle, through the hook, through the line, through the rods, kick in my palm, only the body throbbing. It's, it's quite, I mean, it, it's almost a sexual thing, I think, fly fishing at night. It's the anticipation and waiting for it. It's such an aggressive take when it happens. It's, it's, it's such a sensual thing. That's um, fascinating because in the poems, Tom Rowling often talks about the sea trout as being female. And there's very much a sense that the fishing is some kind of process of courtship or seduction. Yeah, I mean, it, well, it, it, it is an incredibly seductive thing to do, you know. Uh, just on a very basic level, it's seductive to be standing in a river at night and, and being surrounded by the, the sounds and the smells. And, and but, it, but really, it's, it's, it's knowing what what might take, you know, it's knowing that that mm. fish mm. is just under the surface in the inky depths and it's that sort of unknown, yeah. I think. Yeah. And there's, there's another big fish <laughs> just jumping out behind us again. Tempting. She's calling us, luring us back to the water. So do you think for male fishermen there is some kind of instinct to think of the fish as female? Yeah, I mean, most sea trout actually are female. Ah. Um, How come? I don't know. Rowling often talks about it as if the fishing is a process of courtship and the catching of the fish is the marriage, but it's also a marriage that ends in death for the female. Hmm. That is grim. There's a great line at the end of his poem, Torridge Salmon. He's killed the fish and he says, her virgin scales cling to my hands. She came for the feather, found the hook. 
What followed was a craft of killing. Her virgin scales cling to my hands. It seems very sad at that moment. Hmm. But it's also the completion of what he's been trying to do. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a there's a odd sensation I always find it at the end of a fishing session. Sometimes you can come away feeling almost depressed. But it's like a feeling of loss that that the experience is over, and the time always flies past. And and then when it's over, it's it's almost like it's sadness after the ecstasy. You came to my lure, betrayed yourself for a feather. Big ripples on the pool now. It's three, three o'clock in the morning now. The temperature's definitely dipped. I've just put um, a sink tip on. Fish deeper down. I think I, I think I've been seeing ripples on the water. About can you see one there? It may be fish cruising around, but yeah, something's moving around. But it could be an otter. I mean, if it was a, a sort of very noticeable V. One night I was fishing with a friend of mine, and I was fishing down a pool while he was. Um, lying on a gravel bank with his hood up, just looking up at the sky, having a, having a rest. And I heard uh, running behind me uh, and looked round to see what appeared to be a black Labrador running along the bank. And it made a beeline right for where James was lying, with his, with his, with his back to where it was coming from and it ran along the gravel bank towards him but because he because he had his hood up he, he didn't hear it until it was almost right on him and he shot bolt, bolt upright and when he did that this thing basically I don't know who got the biggest fright but this thing just turned and launched itself into the pool <laughs> like a concrete breeze block going in and it was it was a big dog otter wow. so what are you doing now? I'm just going to try a little nymph. A variation on the theme, really. Um, and it can sometimes work a treat. Casting an incredible distance, getting right into the centre of the pool. Oh, I just saw a shooting star. Mm. Look at the look at the ripples. Oh, 
that was a seriously good push. Yeah, the light's changed again now, and there's a kind of greyness in the sky. Mm. Yeah, difficult. Difficult conditions. Do you fancy some tea? You want some tea, Finn? First birds are starting to sing. Actually saw that fish coming out of the water and it was highlighted by the gravel bank just beyond it. They seem to be listening and choosing their moment to jump. Taunting. It seems like that's been changed, doesn't it? Circus act, it's incredible. <sighs> Typical big fish lie under a branch where it's difficult to cover. Happy. Could try a bit longer. Just change. I'm going to put a dry fly on. Uh, a gink top sedge at least. It's just going to sit on the surface. Wild harbour. No blood on the lure when I dressed it. Barred teal and blue hackle, masking the wide gape hook. Now in the dark pool, panic races, twangs the line, screeches the reel, runs till the rod spring compels obedient circles. Flank flash drowning in air, drawn to the net where my loaded club kills. As the torch admires, a dead eye clouds yet stares its question. Out of the shadows, hunter ghosts come close to weigh the wild harvest. I wade again, thigh deep in clear water. Spells, spells certainly broken. <laughs> Where are you, Finn? Yeah. Oops. Oh, I've wait. Even the smaller sea trout are incredibly strong. So 
strawberry, sort of bluey shin. Oh. It is silver. Last. <laughs> <laughs> Release it just at the side of the, the water yet. Yeah. I'll just keep holding the water so I can recover. of the sea trout. He who would seek her in the clear stream, let him go softly as in a dream. He who would hold her well, let him first whisper the spell of her name. The silver one, the shimmering maiden, the milk-white throated bride, the treasure bringer from the sea, leaper of weirs, hurdler to the hills, the returning native, egg carrier, the buxom lass, the wary one, the filly that dies from a moving shadow, the darter away, the restless shiner, lurker in alder roots, the fearful maid, night dancer, ring maker, the one that splinters reflections, the splasher, the jester, the teaser, the mocker, the false encourager, tweaker of lures, the girl who is fasting, destroyer of hopes, bender of steel, the breaker, the smasher, the strong wench, the cartwheeler, the curb of the world. She who doesn't want to surrender, the desired, the sweet one. When you spent nights and days speaking her names, learning her ways, take down your tackle from the shelf and your skill. She may give herself for the whispered spell. That was Night Fishing. Greville Lindop was fishing with Finlay Wilson of Fish Wild. The producer was Matt Thompson. Night Fishing was a Rocket House production for BBC Radio 4.